uh, speaking of this program, and this title is uh, Survey of G2 Manifold, Geometry of G2 Manifolds, and to the two-hour talk, <laughs> we will uh, spend a 10 to 10 minute break. Today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm not sure the title describes these talks um, very precisely. It, it won't be a survey in the sense of trying to tell you all about what's known about this topic, but it will be in the sense that what I'm talking about is work of other people, not my I'm, I'm describing, not, not my own work. Um, but the plan is um, that the, the is it the usual plan? We have two halves with a break in the middle. The first half will be more introductory, and then it'll be more specialized at the end. Um, so I should say, I'm, I'm not quite sure how this topic fits into the, um, the general program. Um, I, I chose it because it at least has some um, definite connections, as you'll see, with Poisson geometry and so forth, will play an important role. Uh, well, also because um, some of the later, more, more constructions we'll be discussing, um, possibly, possibly there will be interesting if there's any feedback from possibly similar things appear in other areas of maths, theoretical physics, and I'd be very interested to know if that was the case. So let's begin. The, um, the, the general context which is um, an existence of some special geometric structures in dimensions 6, 7, and 8, which can be defined by um, the existence of parallel forms of a suitable kind. in the sense that we can think of them as Riemannian manifolds with certain differential forms which are covariant constant in terms of the levi civita connection. So, as I said, there are three cases uh, in dimension six. Uh, what, what, what I need to do is to tell you what the model forms are in the standard, standard model. So our, our, our model will be a R6, uh, but we'll think of it as C3. And um, we have a pair of forms in question. One is omega, the standard Kähler form, metric form, as usual. The other, we'll call it rho, uh, we'll take the, the real part of the complex volume form, dz1, dz2, dz3 in our standard coordinates on C3. So if we have a six manifold, Romanian six-manifold with a pair of parallel differential forms which agree with this standard model and a suitable <coughs> basis of the tangent space, then this is the same as having a, um, a calabi yau threefold or a, a manifold with holonomy contained in SU3. SO6. <coughs> then uh, in dimension 7, uh, we take R7 is R direct sum C3 with C3 as above and the coordinate T in the R direction. And then our model form, the three form, phi which is um, omega dt plus rho. <clears throat> this also, using the, the standard metric, this also, of course, gives us a four form with the Hodge star. So we also have star phi. <laughs> so then a, a, a Riemannian seven manifold with a three form, which is covariant constant, agrees with the standard model, that's the same as having holonomy 
contained in the exceptional Lie group G2 inside SO7. And then the next case, which we won't ever talk much about, would be to take R8. We could think of it as R7 direct sum R, the coordinate S in the R direction, and take a four form psi, which is um, the phi we had before, did yes, plus the star phi. And this corresponds to the holonomy contained in a copy of the Lie group spin 7 Im embedded in SO8. So this is the uh, seven-dimensional star? This is the seven-dimensional star, yeah. Yeah, yeah this is star phi on R8. This is with respect to the seven-dimensional star. But that's right. So it, it ends up as a four-form. So, yeah. So there are many interesting things to say and questions to ask about the existence of such manifolds. But for this talk, we're going to suppose that we, we have one, and uh, we're interested in the geometry that we can do inside it or over it. <coughs> so, um, there are two flavors to this. One is um, what's called calibrated geometry. So it has to do with submanifolds. And let's um, let's just really go through this the seven dimensional case. <clears throat> Supposing I take my standard R three in C three, the real in the standard way, then uh, also I can embed that in my R7 in this model. So I take the standard R3 contained in C3 contained in R7. <coughs> so I, I get another viewpoint on my seven dimensional space as the sum of this R3 and its orthogonal complement R4. <coughs> and uh, if I write this three form from that point of view, you find it could be written like this. If I have coordinates yi, say, on R3, then phi is um, minus the sum of omega i dy i plus dy1 dy2 dy3, where omega i is the standard basis for the self-dual two forms on R4 in complementary states. So we, we, just to be, this will be rather, this will be rather Crucial in the talk, so let's just make sure we all quit. We recall we take lambda 2 of R4, and we have the, the star operation. Take lambda 2 to lambda 2, star squared is 1, so we decompose into the plus and minus 1 eigenspaces. The self-dual forms are the ones which are equal to their star. <coughs> and so, it's, uh, so this is going to be the crucial formula actually, in this talk, when we get into more detail. <clears throat> of course, I'm writing things in a very coordinate-dependent way. We could have done things more invariantly. But what's going on here is that the presence of this um, given three-form induces an isomorphism between R3 and the self-dual subspace of its normal bundle. So, so R3... <laughs> Canonically isomorphic via phi to lambda 2 plus of R4. And that's why we can write down invariantly this expression. <coughs> so 
So in general, um, a three-dimensional subspace of my R7 furnished with its phi is called associative if it's equivalent to this standard model. In other words, if there's an element <coughs> of the symmetry group, that this exceptional group G2, which preserves phi but takes my given subspace to this, this form. So any associative subspace, my three form, can be written in this fashion. And we always have this isomorphism between the subspace and the self-dual subspace of its orthogonal complement. Yeah, this leads to the notion of associative. So there's, what we're saying is that inside the, the, the Grassmannian of all three-dimensional subspaces of R7, that has uh, dimension 12, inside there, <coughs> phi it gives us a, a submanifold of these associative subspaces, which is in fact an eight-dimensional uh, submanifold of the Grassmannian. Is that easy to see that it's eight? Well, it's not. It's not exactly easy, but it's not exactly. G two has got dimension fourteen, and the stabilizer of one of these subspaces is SO four acting on the R4, so it's 14 minus 6. <clears throat> so it, now going to a, a manifold, if I have a one of the seven manifolds with one of these structures defined by a, a parallel three form of this kind, I have the notion of an associative submanifold, one whose tangent space is everywhere an associative subspace. So these are um, so the <coughs> the main interesting geometric objects we want to discuss, uh, and they they can be they have two interesting characterizations. There are two special things about these. So one is that they have a kind of a Fleur type characterization. By that I mean they can be written as the critical points of a functional, or at least a kind of a many-valued functional, but local, a functional which is locally defined in the space of all submanifolds. Uh, but this functional is not like the kind of standard kind of volume functional or something, um, which where the Hessian at the critical point would typically be a <coughs> something like a plus operator or something. We only have a finite dimensional negative subspace. Uh, the characteristic feature of these Fleur-type situations is that the Hessian has got a spectrum which is unbounded in both directions. <clears throat> so what is this, um, what is this functional? Uh, so it's not, it's not, so if we, if we choose some base, some reference submanifold, L0, and then we look at any other submanifold, L, what we do is we choose <clears throat> a four-dimensional submanifold, or this chain, with boundary is L minus L naught. So we're working inside a given homology class of submanifolds in our manifold. Uh, and then we set, we define our functional, the value of F on L is equal to the integral over W of, so what can we do? If W is four-dimensional, we want to integrate a four-form the full form that we have around is star phi. <clears throat> so this is not exactly 
well defined. One reason is we have an arbitrary choice of base point. That would change this by a constant. Uh, another is that we have a choice of w. So the, the crucial thing is that star phi is what's covariant constant, so in particular it's closed. So that means that this is independent of as it were, small deformations of w. Or in fact, more precisely, if we change w with the, in the given relative homology class, we don't change this thing. Um, so that's, but if we made some different, sort of rel, show some different relative homology class, then we would change this. So it's sort of a many-valued function or on a suitable covering space of the space of submanifolds, it would become well-defined. But in any case, you can check, as the differential geometry, that the critical points of this function are given by this associative condition, so elementary differential geometric exercise. So delta of it. And the other characterization is, in a sense, more straightforward, and is this is actually this calibrated condition. That's to say, if I take any three-dimensional submanifold L, then the volume of L with respect to the induced metric is less than or equal to the integral over L of the three form, phi, with equality if and only if associative. So this is, this is just a, the equality discussion is just a pointwise discussion about the special properties of this three form. On, the, on our model subspace, when the, in the R3 direction, this just gives the volume form. In any other three-dimensional subspace, phi is less than the volume, at most of the volume form. So on the hand, this thing is topological or hom homological. It just depends upon, since phi is closed, this is just the pairing between the homology class of L and the cohomology class of phi, assuming everything's compact, of course. So notice that these two things use different properties. of One is, uses the fact that d phi is 0, and d star of phi is 0. And those are, one can, some, some, one can weaken this so geta holonomy condition in various directions, and so one might give up one or other of these. But both of them, both of them enter. How can you do that since they're both equivalent? How can you weaken? They're both equivalent to both, I mean, each one applies the other. Right, but not the closed condition. I mean, uh, um, oh, oh, you, you, could you could have a you could have a phi which was closed, but not, or, and vice versa. And uh, the two together, in fact, if you have this and this, implies the covariant constant condition. So it's the it's the existence of these two special properties which makes these. Uh, associative submanifolds, particularly interesting things to study. Uh, there's a. Let me get it on. There are similar discussion that we won't go through in detail in other dimensions. So six, seven, eight. Um, so these associative things, the, the, the crucial thing is that they're co dimension four. So here we have the associatives. There are other things that happen in co-dimension three. <clears throat> so the whole table will be in a six manifold. In co-dimension four, we have complex curves. So these, this is, these are the sort of familiar things, complex curves in our Calabi-Yard threefold. 
Uh, and then there's a, there's some, a similar discussion in the eight-dimensional case defines what are called Cayley submanifolds. And then uh, in co-dimension three, here we have special Lagrangians, and there's something called co-associatives, which are just ones the four-dimensional submanifolds whose tangent space is everywhere the orthogonal complement of an associative subspace. So we have all these lovely calibrated objects to play with, but I will not have time to talk about any. These are related in the natural ways. If we have a, uh, a special Lagrangian is an associative in the product of the Calabria with R. If you take a complex curve and multiply that by R, you get another kind of associative and, and so forth. So the, the, another distinctive feature of these is that they're all elliptic equations. I mean, de 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 determined elliptic equations. We could, for example, put, um, we could have said, well, we also have complex surfaces in our Calabi A manifold, but that wouldn't, that's an overdetermined equation, so it wouldn't really fit in in the same way. So in other words, in each case, there's a there's a Fredholm deformation theory. There's an index, which gives the expected dimension, at least, of the moduli space of these things, and so forth, just as we're familiar with in the case of complex curves. Five things, five, five examples. Though. Yeah, five. Yeah. But, but um, o only these are ever going to appear in the rest of the discussion. Some, some questions? If you add a, a, a vector bundle to a connection uh, on top of a complex surface, would it be a better equation, or is it still always done? Well, we're going to come to vector bundles just now. Um, or, or, on a complex surface, yes, that would be that would be another example of a elliptic. I mean, that in six dimensions, if if you want to study the dimensions of complex surfaces together with a vector bundle on, on top of them, or, or some shift, would would that make it? But the determined system of equations, or it's still over-determined? Uh, no, that, was, that would be good from this point of view. I think, yeah. In fact, we're going to be talking about rather similar things to that. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Well, let's, let's now go on to the other kind of geometry we want to discuss, which is uh, gauge theory, or Yang-Mills geometry. So over our, over our manifold, we'll be considering a bundle, say a principal bundle, with some Lie group G, a structure group, and connections on this bundle. So in, in general, if we have holonomy H, then, uh, so this would be contained in SON, where N is the dimension, then we can think of sort of Lambda 2 as Rn is the Lie algebra of SON. So we get a, 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 a vector subspace corresponding to the Lie algebra of H inside here. There, lambda 2H. Yeah. And the same thing will apply on our manifold with a given structure, that we will have a, a subspace of the two forms determined by when we have this restricted holonomy group. We'll pick out some subspace of the two forms in this way. So we say a connection is an instanton if the curvature lies inside this preferred subspace lambda to h at each point, of course, with values in the relevant bundle. So it's just a linear condition on the on the curvature. <coughs> So again, there are, th there are three cases to discuss. Let's just, the eight dimensions is never going to really appear. In the, um, the seven dimensional case, uh, what happens is that we, speak, we split the, uh, so the two forms in seven dimension have got, seven dimensions have got dimension 21. This G2 has got 
uh, dimension 14. So what happens here is that we decompose the two forms into a 14-dimensional piece and a 7-dimensional piece. <coughs> and we're requiring that the 7-dimensional piece vanish. And that's, a, that's equivalent to saying that uh, we take the curvature and take the wedge product with star phi is equal to 0. This is another way of writing this equation. Oh, I, I kind of lost it. Uh, so you have this principle, m is four-dimensional? No, m is, well, uh, m, m is a general. Uh, I'm saying this is something we can do in any dimension. If we have a restricted, we have some holonomy group, which is not the full SON, we get a corresponding subspace of the two forms. And this is, a, at least we can always, this is always a notion we can define. It happens to be interesting in these cases. And in seven dimensions, this just can be written as this equation here. See, this, this thing... M, M is, M is seven. Well, that, I'm specializing to here, yeah, to seven M dimensions. Seven, and the, the connection has curvature in... So then, so lambda two is lambda two fourteen plus lambda two seven, where this corresponds to the Lie algebra of G two. This seven dimensional component, you can think see by taking the wedge product with the four form to get up to the six six forms, which are the same as tangent vectors. So this the, so have, so the kid the if you're calculating the answer to the statement, I can't. I don't know what the statement is. That's right. The, the statement is that, in, in, in general, complete generality, we can write down this condition on a connection that its curvature lies in this distinguished space of two forms. Okay. If we apply that in the case of uh, holonomy G two, so we have an M seven phi, then that turns out to be equivalent to this condition. You that, that being is holonomy. That, because I was this this thing is the same as the projection onto this factor. So saying it lies inside here is saying that the projection onto this factor is zero. And that's just this, this equation. equation. I guess the question is what does it mean geometrically? So there is some co compatibility between the holonomy, the geometric holonomy and the curvature of the, of your bundle. Is there a nice uh, uh, it, uh, something like that. I mean, in particular, the levy chip interconnection will always have this property because, by general principles, so. Um, yeah. Anyways, in, in, let's just mention the six-dimensional case, uh, the calabi yau case. Then uh, th this condition is the same as saying first that the curvature has got type one one, so. That means that the connection defines a holomorphic structure on our bundle. And secondly, that the, well, the trace of the 1, 1 part of the curvature is 0. Um, and that is what's called the hermitian yang mills equation. So uh, by uh, old theorem, uh, actually we identify these instantons in that situation with the stable holomorphic vector bundles. Stable vector bundle plus Hermitian Yang Mills connection. But I would say th this thing always exists. So this, this is the, so the, the upshot is that just in, in the submanifold situation, we ended up doing complex geometry, studying complex curves. So in this gauge theory situation, when we go down to six dimensions, we end up doing studying holomorphic bundles. And so I let's not so there's, there's another interesting discussion in eight dimensions, but let's not let's not uh, go into that. So we have let's just <coughs> saying more about this seven dimensional setup. We have a formal setup, which is exactly analogous to what we said before in the case of submanifolds. We have a. In this, sorry, I don't have this abstract. In the, 
in the general situation, G is a compact lead group, MN is manifold. What are you assuming MN is Riemannian? Yes, I'm saying it's a, it's a Riemannian manifold with holonomy, some, in interest case, some, prom, some proper subgroup of SON. And then so the bundle is adapted to that geometry by this condition. This, okay. is, this is a condition that we can write down. So now we have, um, again, we have a Fleur type characterization of these instantons on a G2 manifold involving the, the Chern Simons functional. How does that go? So if we have, um, again, we choose a reference connection on our given bundle, and then we can define a Chern Simons invariant of any other connection. Um, pair for A naught and A, uh, which is characterized by it's a, it's a three form, which has got the property that D of it gives the difference between the trace of F A squared minus the trace of F A naught squared. <clears throat> so then we write down a similar formula. We write down F of A is the integral over our seven manifold of this Chern Simons three form wedge star phi. And again, uh, because of, um, let's see what I'm saying. Because this is closed, that means that if I, I made, made a change in choice of A naught, I, wouldn't, I would only change this by a constant. And again, the property is that the Euler-Lagrange equation for this functional is um, the same thing. But uh, this this functional is not fully gauge invariant. If we apply a gauge transformation, again, we might change this. But for for a local discussion, it is. If we apply a small gauge transformation. So it's um, preserved if we, if we make some homotopically non-trivial gauge transformation, then we would change this function. So, so <coughs> and we have the analog of the, the, the calibrated condition for any, for any connection so we've got the calibrated inverted commas now. This is the analog of the standard thing one does studying instantons on four manifolds. If we take any connection A, then um, the Yang Mills functional is at least, I mean, I'm ignoring signs and factors, at least uh, the wedge product of phi with the same. <coughs> Trace of S squared, the thing, this kind of characteristic class gadget, um, <coughs> with equality if and only if we have S A as an instant. Now, again, this thing is topological. This is given by the pairing between phi and the second churn class appropriate characteristic class of the bundle. Beyond that, the integration is uh, over the metric which is related to the canonical form that you mentioned in, in the beginning, because like... The, the, the volume form. Yes. yes, this is the, the Romanian volume form. Of the metric which is... Uh, yes, of, of, of the given... We're supposed to have a Romanian manifold, and there's probably some factor that mm. we should come in there. Sure. So these are the, we've, roughly speaking, defined all the special geometric objects that we want to look at and try to explain why they have these very special properties. And of, of course, what I'm saying is not at all new. <coughs> 
In fact, going, going back to the, the 1990s, the kind of um, point of view, when, when, when the time when people began to study topological field theories and things of this kind, there's sort of a mantra or point of view which says that in such a situation, uh, if we're in, so if we have, speaking, if we're in eight dimensions, then it's, it's reasonable to imagine that we could, or hope, that we could obtain numerical invariance by counting our Cayley submanifolds or the solutions of the G2 instant on equation. So dimension eight. So we would just have, as it were, numbers or so numerical invariance, I might hope for. And then the general sort of uh, mantra would say that uh, derived from that in dimension seven, you should have a sort of Fleur type invariance. So these would be Fleur homology, Thing, things, things resembling the Fleur homology groups in <coughs> for three dimensional manifolds or in symplectic geometries, and also numbers, because you can take the dimensions or Euler characteristics to go from homology groups to, to numbers. And then in dimension six, the, um, the mantra would say that we should have, we should have categories, something like that, uh, but then we should also have uh, some simpler things, also some homology, and also some numbers. 1990s. So what I'm just saying is that these are the things that one could hope to have given the formal structure of the situation, the very rough formal structure. Um, so I said so this is, goes back at least 20 years. Um, the only part of this which is well established is this simplest thing here defining numerical invariance of kalabi yau manifolds by, roughly speaking, counting holomorphic bundles or complex curves, or more generally, counting sheaves of various kinds. So these are the, um, what are called DT invariants, going back to Richard Thomas's thesis. So this, at least this is rigorously foundation, Everything else is science fiction or <laughs> wishful <laughs> something not uh, rigorously established. But that's the point of the talk, is to discuss that. So there is, uh, you do see algebraic geometry type papers which discuss categorification of these things, which should have some connection with our story, but not, probably not exactly what we would want to do. So, I just want to emphasize the existence of any of this is speculative at best, possibly doubtful. But it gives a kind of a, um, a context for our discussion. Good for time. Now let me give it a, let me, without trying to get into any talking about what these categories of homology things might be, uh, let's just give a, a sort of a geometric picture which maybe gives some motivation for wanting to do something like that. So if we start in a very simple way, Let's just consider a, a Riemann surface, X or S, a Riemann surface and a holomorphic map to, um, to C um, with, with branch points. Or maybe I should have a proper holomorphic map or something with branch points, simple branch points. So branch cover. So let's suppose we have a, a pair of branches. So we have, say, P, P1 and P2 in S, f of pi is a zi in C. So what we 
in a linear sort of way. What, what we can see is a pair of points, a pair of complex numbers. On some other. Over this, we have our Riemann surface. So we can ask somehow, do, is P1 on the same sheet as P2? So what would we mean by that? I think Z1 and Z2 has been quite close together this discussion. If we look, um, if we look uh, sort of at a point close to Z2, then we're going to see, we look, we look at what happens to F sort of over a little bit of interval here, we're going to see two points that come together at the branch point. And similarly, if we go over here, we're going to see two points that come together. So by being on the same sheet, I mean if we go from Z1 to Z2 along this path, do, do we get some matching up, or do we get a picture that uh, these are completely different? This is not completely well defined, so it depends upon a choice of path from Z1 to Z2. You might go down some huge path and have some monodromy, which would give a different answer. But I think you get the idea. So, more generally, uh, we could take a, a Lefschetz vibration of some complex manifold, X Lefschetz vibration. So, again, we have a pair of critical points and a pair of critical values. What would the corresponding discussion be here? Yeah, this is Z1 and Z2. At a nearby smooth fiber, we have what's called a vanishing cycle. And here we have a vanishing cycle. And then if we move these sort of two to this, the midpoint, we get a pair of vanishing cycles in the same fiber. So we're asking whether, so the, the, the question is whether these things intersect or not. That would be the, the analogous question to what we asked before. Whether the, so we're looking at the intersection of vanishing cycles. <clears throat> so how could we what is actually equivalent to this parallel transporting our vanishing cycles around would be to look at the the gradient flow of a real valued function associated from f so without this generality Z1 minus Z2 is real because we can always just rotate things to reduce to that case. Uh, and then we can look at the gradient flow of the real part of F. And um, it's not hard to see, but the, the, the gradient lines that run from P1 to P2 exactly correspond to these intersection points of the vanishing cycle. Because the, the vanishing cycles are just the things that flow in under this gradient flow to P1 here, and the other things flow in here, and you're just looking at the usual kind of picture. So this thing corresponds to gradient flow lines. So gradient flow lines. So what we're saying is we have a way of studying the geometry of vanishing cycles, which is a crucial thing, in terms of studying the gradient flow lines of the real part of our function. And we, we, we could always, of course, as I said, we could always rotate our function to change the real part to the imaginary part uh, as, as appropriate. So, of course, this intersection, we, what, what we could do, the basic thing we could do would be to look at the intersection number, just to count the flow lines, more, um, more ambitiously we could look at things like the, what's called the Foucault seidel category, I think, which is constructed out of the, the, um, the collection of these vanishing cycles and the, the flow homology groups defined by the symplectic stroke. Th these are Lagrangian submanifolds, and so they have some flow homology groups. <laughs> 
<coughs> so what does that have to do with the previous discussion? <coughs> if we take, um, if we take, say, curves in um, in a Calabi R threefold, they can be thought of a, the, the we have the same formal picture. They can be thought of as the critical points of a holomorphic function. Critical points of a holomorphic, or at least a, a, a locally defined function. Just a function defined uh, in just the same way as we did before, but using the whole holomorphic three form. So we get a real and imaginary part. <coughs> and the gradient lines. Will correspond to associative in uh, R times R Calabi R three manifold. So the idea would be that to study the analog of these gradient lines in this higher dimensional picture, we would study associative submanifolds in this cylinder, which are asymptotic at one end to one curve. An asymptotic at the other end to the other curve. <clears throat> and if we could count those, it would give us a way of making sense of this intersection of these vanishing cycles, which of course are completely, I mean, they, I think it'll be input dimensional, so there'll be no sort of standard definition of that. Or more ambitiously still, going up to eight dimensions, we might hope to get some structure which would define the analog of the Foucault-Seidel category of the fiber in this situation. So that's all, I'm that's all we'll say about that, just to give some I hope, motivation that it would be an exciting thing to be able to do, to, uh, to count associatives in this way, and give some maybe previously undiscovered structure on the set of curves in a Calabi R threefold, or just the same discussion for holomorphic bundles with G2 instantons over the same. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, we could, now would be a good time, or I, and I got one more, in 10 minutes would also be a good time. I can, should I go for 10 minutes? That, that would match up with my... So this is, it were, kind of the dream, but now we're not doing any more of that. We go back to reality. <laughs> because, uh, well, let's say all this, people have been talking about this sort of thing for 20 years. Uh, coming into the 21st century, um, attention has switched more to trying to make sense of this rigorously, and there are uh, fundamental difficulties that emerge. So that's what I'm going to be, the rest of the talk will be about. <clears throat> so mostly I'm going to talk about a difficulty that has to do with the gauge theory setup. But let me mention one in just that has to do with associatives because it maybe has some connection with well, things I heard about when I went to another lecture in this course on string topology and so forth. So this is, um, so say, Joyce's disaster. Jo 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 Joyce's disaster. So this is, a, this is a difficulty predicted by Joyce uh, and confirmed by, by work of uh, Nordstrom, which I think has not appeared yet. So it's a difficulty, let's suppose we're trying to count associatives to get some number. I mean, what we want is a deformation invariant. If we change our phi slightly, we don't change this number, or we only change it in some very understandable way. And the, the difficulty is this. Supposing we have, if we have a pair of associatives, then these are three-dimensional things in a seven-dimensional thing, so they won't generically intersect. But in a one-parameter family of situations, then we could expect that they typically will do. So we could have one, 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 the red piece comes up and cuts across the white piece in a one-parameter family. 
going through a critical time when they intersect. So intersection is not a problem for the analysis individually because I mean, the, we can just work with emotions. We don't, if we're just studying the red one, we don't need to see the white one in our analysis at all. <coughs> so they just carry on through and we get another uh, the other pair. Go to this picture. But, but what happens, as uh, Joyce realized, is that when we make this crossing, a new associative is born that wasn't seen at all. Well, it could be either born or die, but uh, th things change. So either, either a, a new one is born or an old one dies. I think it's symmetrical between this picture. Uh, corresponding to the connected sum of these two things. So if we were just doing our counting nicely, here we had two, say, and here we have two, but we have the extra one, so we have three. Or possibly here we had the other way around. I mean, it's a symmetrical picture, one of them dies. So a new one, say, a new one is born. Is it obvious that it's associated? Yeah. That's so this so what Nordstrom proved uh, provided they cross in a transverse fashion and so forth, then you can prove the existence of this thing. <coughs> So that's one problem to mull over. But let's leave that and talk from now on. We're going to talk about the problem of instant on bubbling. And, uh, sorry, why this is this was called disaster? Uh, well, I think Joyce views it as a reason why one couldn't do any a fundamental. Uh, well, it's it's. It's a disaster because if we're just trying to construct an enumerative invariant, which is a deformation invariant, we have to somehow um, do something about this, this extra one, which is... Oh. I, I, I mean, is it, it, that's only my... This is not a standard terminology. <laughs> this is just Joyce's... A, 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 a phenomena predicted by Joyce, confirmed by Nordstrom. Well, I think the... Elementary point that you're trying to make is that this new one appears, and so you're adding one to the count. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's all, I think that's all. So it's still here. The, the new one is still here. And the new one, as we deform, the new one could go. We might not be able to determine that the new, <laughs> this one came from this pet, was born in this way. We can control. Yeah, exactly. If, if there was some way of controlling, I mean, the, right. So we. Exactly. So the, the, the question. Well, well, maybe let's maybe that maybe it was unwise to call this <laughs> potential disaster. <laughs> yes. A challenge for the field is to <laughs> is to um, do something which takes account of this phenomenon. And there are a number of other uh, there are a number of other uh, similar challenges. Um, I'm only going to talk about one of them to do with so the connection between the, the gauge theory and the uh, we can um, so, okay. but, but maybe I should make a general point that uh, from the point of view of some people, one might, th might think the whole point is to have these fancy invariants and st structures and so forth. Uh, from the point of view of another kind of matrician, might say the whole point is to study these, uh, the geometry and analysis of these objects and see what happens. So, uh, regardless of whether one can extract numbers out of anything, understanding and proving rigorously that what happens in these families is a very interesting uh, analytical thing to do. And, and similarly for this, the next discussion. So we'll stop in, in five minutes, but let's see you again. So let's just review something. So in, in, in any dimension n, 
is the fact that if we consider a Yang-Mills connection over the unit ball in Rn with <coughs> sufficiently small energy, so there is Yang-Mills, an integral over the unit ball Bn of the L squared is less than some constant, depending on the dimension, then this gives complete control of our Yang-Mills connection, since that we get in a suitable gauge, we get estimates on all derivatives of our connection form in, in, a, in the interior of B. Goes to C infinity control on the interior. So, in other words, more or less, in this regime, the nonlinear Yang Mills equation behaves like a linear elliptic equation. I thought that was special in dimension four because it's a two-form. No, no, this is, this is, but the crucial thing, this is the unit ball. So what is crucial is the scaling behavior. Oh, so uh, if we take a ball of radius r, then, then the corresponding thing to consider is this normalized thing, 1 over r to the n minus 4 integral of mod x squared. This is the scale invariant. Okay. So if we have our manifold and we take some tiny ball, it's not the energy over the ball we need to be small, it's this scaled energy. So we need to be even small, small compared to, suitably compared to r. So, it, given that, it's, it's the elementary consequence that we get a, a, a compactness theorem of co-dimension four subsets. So, if we have the sequence AI with the Yang-Mills functional is less than some fixed constant C, then taking a subsequence, which I will suppress, we get convergence to some connection on so our manifold, whatever we're doing, minus a singular set, S, where the co-dimension in the Hausdorff sense of S is uh, bigger than or equal to 4. Now, this, this just follows from a sort of a covering argument based upon covering with balls of given, given size. And the, so the, the Hausdorff dimension notion precisely involves the number of balls you need to cover of a given radius. So this is, this is not, not a difficult fact. So that's... Um, see in, our, in our situation, we're specializing to the case of these instantons we exactly have this hypothesis because our Yang Mills functional is some topological invariant, so we can suppose we're working with a sequence of connections on the same bundle. Uh, we have this, so we, we, we have convergence outside this co dimension four set. Of course, extending the familiar case, if we had a four manifold, this would be a, a finite set of points. We've got the familiar mm -hmm. bubbling of instantons outside a finite set of points. <clears throat> but I should emphasize, so we should say that this, this, a, a priori, this set could be very bad. I mean, it's just, it's just a general set. This is not, this is not a priori a manifold, anything like that. This could be some very badly behaved set. But th this is what one gets just from the general nature, the general nature of things. <clears throat> So old, going back to at the turn of the century, results of Chan and Chan and Tao uh, say more in the in in the let's just say the G two case. I mean, we're studying instantons. Then um, so the the, the co dimension four part of S is say associative. Well, I put it in inverted commas. It could be a very singular thing, but it, almost everywhere, in the sense of 
of a measure, it has a tangent space, and that tangent space satisfies the associative condition. Uh, and moreover, well, if, technically, if this is actually smooth, then this connection A infinity extends over that co-dimension part. So, so the, co let's just, the co dimension part of S is a removable singularity for A infinity. Roughly. Slightly simplifying. Going just the same way as the familiar Eulenbeck theorem in, in four dimensions, that you can have a sequence of instantons that are bubbling at a point, <coughs> but the limit connection extends smoothly. So you take the limit, it's a perfectly good smooth connection. So this is where we'll stop for our break, but we've sort of got to... This is how the two stories, the calibrated story the subset, and the instance on story, become intertwined when one tries to study limits and compactness properties. But let's stop there, and then we'll come back in, whatever, five minutes. <laughs>Andre Hades and Thomas Walpuski, uh, with also an area which um, Alexander Doan, who's somewhere, not here, has made important contributions in this area. So, um, and, and is connected to various other developments of work of Taubes and other people that. Um, Possibly I'll have time to say something about. <laughs> so we want to study in more detail this process of bubbling of a sequence of G2 instantons over an associative submanifold. So, so strictly we might have to encounter not just submanifolds but bizarre singular things, but let's, let's not, let's suppose that we have a submanifold. So we, we have a, a, a three-manifold Y inside M7 phi associative. We study, want to study bubbling along Y. And um, if, if, to simplify things, uh, this is time is not completely on our side. We may sometimes want to think of Y as a three torus and everything being flat, so we can just work with coordinates. So, e.g., Y equals T3, I with, a, with a trivial normal bundle. This is, this is a picture of Y. And we're, th we're thinking of a sequence of instantons which are <coughs> bubbling off in a, a natural sense over Y. So we can imagine that at each point we can define a certain scale. I mean, the uh, natural scale, where, roughly speaking, where the, curvi the, the high, a high curvature region of a certain scale. This, this scale may vary from point to point. But let's suppose it doesn't vary too much, so we can find some overall scale. So assume this is an overall scale. Let's call it the square root of epsilon. <coughs> so as if we, if we look on, if we look at the size of order the square root of epsilon, and rescale, we'll see some connection, it's in this normal direction, with bounded curvature on the four-dimensional normal subspace. Rescale is 
you rescale it looks nice. We, we rescale this. We take this four-dimensional disk transverse to our submanifold, which has got a small radio subsilon, and rescale it to size one. And then we'll see a, a connection, which is um, not trivial, but it's got curvature roughly one in size. Yeah, that's the idea. But I should say the analysis of this is far from properly worked out. So, in particular, it's not it's not really known that there is some overall. Maybe it's maybe the scale over half of the manifold is completely different from the scale of another half of the manifold, or things of that kind. But let's suppose we're in a favorable situation. <clears throat> but let's go back to our formula for phi. Let's take coordinates yi in the, uh, along y and xi in the, the normal direction, or xi. direction. So remember, phi is equal to uh, this thing, dy1 dy2 dy3 minus the sum of um, omega i dy i, where these are the self-dual two forms in the x direction. Uh, and then star phi is going to be uh, uh, dx1 dx2 dx3 dx4 uh, minus the sum of omega i dyj dyk, where ijk run over cyclic permutations. So if we rescale, so we take x to um, root epsilon x, then uh, the effect of that, when we pull, we pull back our four form far phi under this map, is that we're going to put a factor uh, epsilon, epsilon squared in here and epsilon here. If we do this, if, if we do this rescaling. <clears throat> so our equation, remember our equation is fa wedge phi is equal to zero. Uh, we can build in this rescaling by just putting this phi epsilon in here. Of course, there's equivalent equation because it just got, we're just changing coordinates by this scale factor. <clears throat> So what we, want to under, what we want to understand is how this equation behaves as epsilon tends to zero. So schematically, we can say the curvature has got, I mean, it's got, a, it's got a curvature in the y direction, let's call it fyy, the curvature in the x direction, let's call it fxx, and a mixed component, let's call it fxy. So if you write out what these equations are saying, they come to two equations. One is that f uh, plus x is equal to epsilon fy. And the other is, let's write it rather schematically, p of f of xy is equal to 0. Sorry, F, X, F. This is just means splitting the co shorthand notation. So this has got no, there's no epsilon in here. Epsilon only enters in this equation here. So what this means, of course, is that we're taking the self-dual part of the curvature in the x direction, and because of our, remember we said that the self-dual part of the normal bundle is identified with the tangent bundle, and on the tangent bundle, we by two forms, with one forms, things by the star. So that's how we make sense of this equation. What's the P? Uh, P is a certain projection that we won't define from. Um, so this fxy lives in sort of r4 tensor r3, and there's a certain projection of that to r4 that we, won't, we don't need to write up. We'll, we'll come back to. The point is there's no epsilon in this. So it's a, it's a, this is a linear condition on the, the mixed part of the curvature, independent of epsilon. 
So, uh, proceeding naively, uh, well, initially naively, we can just take the limit of this as epsilon tends to zero. This equation is not changed, and we just put f plus xx is zero. So this is a familiar thing to do, what's called an adiabatic limit. So the adiabatic limit To be put epsilon equals zero in this equation. So this, uh, this adiabatic limit is precisely saying that our equations are becoming instantons in the x direction. Uh, the y direction is very big. If you, if, you, you know, if we thought of just sailing the whole thing, then the y direction would become... Oh, yeah. So we have this family of equations which, for non-zero epsilon, they are just the equations we're studying, written in a certain coordinates. But we can, we can at least inform, we can make sense of them when epsilon is zero. So this equation, so, so this is saying we have an instanton on the fibers, and this is an equation for how the instanton evolves in the y direction. In general, the mixed part of the curvature you can think of as, in a sense, the derivative of the connection in one variable with respect to the other variable, as we'll see. In that mixed one, there is also a component of the uh, connection in the y direction. So it's not just... Well, well that drops out. I mean, that, that was here. Right. In the mixed part, fxy. Well, that's true, but if you think of if, if you think of using parallel transport in the y direction to identify the fibers, then fxy becomes the derivative of the connection under that identification. But let's not get into I mean, that time will run out if we so. What's, what's plausible, then, is that the bubbling will occur if and only if there's a non-trivial solution of this equation, star epsilon. So that's plausible. Bubbling. Of, well, of star zero. And uh, this is plausible and is, um, in some parts of it, approved. Thomas Walpuski proved that if there is a non-trivial solution of this, then, uh, in a certain sense, you, you will see this bubbling. More precisely, supposing you consider a one-parameter family of phi's or other kind of perturbation of the situation, if, for some critical situation, you have a solution to this equation, then, similar to the Joyce-Nordstrom discussion, Either you'll get something disappearing by bubbling off on y, or you can't, see, you can't really tell the sign, or something new will be born. So there'll be a definite change in the count of instantons as we pass through one of the special situations where um, we have a solution of this equation. So I'm being a bit vague here, uh, intentionally, because we also want to talk about more or less some sort of trivialization at infinity. When we do this rescaling, our connections will be defined on all of our four, and we want to assume they have finite energy, but there's also some, some data we want to prescribe at infinity, which will tell you how your bubble is glued into the background connection. So this condition, this equation also depends upon the the background connection that you're bubbling off to, the A infinity. But um, let's just ignore that. Let's not try to get into that level of detail. Okay. So this is the main point. This is the, 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 the difficulty, is that we expect in codimension one to see non-trivial solutions of this equation, and then we will change the naive count of our ins our instantons. So, 
So this is the. Um, Well, possibly it's all part of the same picture in some grand way, but not not at the moment. This is a different, yeah. a different, a similar but different phenomenon. So, so, what is the um, the natural way you could try to get around this? So, in this picture, as we vary our phi t, we're still going to see our associative. I mean, we can suppose this is just evolving in a nice, unobstructed way. So nothing, nothing happens to our associative as we go along. So we have an associative here, we have an associative here. Here we have a G2 instant on, say, but then here we didn't. If we had a way of counting weights for this yt, such that the weight which we counted changed by 1 or minus 1, depending on the theory of our signs, exactly at this time, then counting the associatives with this weight but exactly take, a, take account of this bubbling phenomenon. So we seek a weight theory so that WYT has the correct jump. Okay. You're evading the associator by the bubble? Waiting to no, we're just saying we, we want to say we have some theory that will allow us to count yt for t less than zero, say, with weight three, and then here it had counted it with weight four. And that jump from three to four would exactly counteract the, the, the death of this instanton, if we had such a theory. No. no. Why was there a death of the instanton? Because you go through a time where you have a solution of this adiabatic equation, and then you can, although you can't, just for some index reasons, you can't perturb that to finite epsilon for fixed t inside the family you can. So this is this a generic picture that you get this. Well, instanton numbers are in there because the homology, uh, when you bubble, as it were, you count the contribution to the Chern class is given by the instanton number in the normal direction times the fundamental class of y. So that, they're, they're going on in the story. So this instanton that we have in the x direction will have a certain instanton number. But they're not in themselves going to do this. Okay. So this hades malpuski program is precisely to um, define uh, some weights that will do this. Possibly also having uh, working well in these other problems to do with the Joyce disaster with this crossing of... But let's not, not get into that. So the so, so the basic idea I'll say it in two ways so the, the sort of slogan would be to say we're going to do a, a norm a Fourier norm transform in the normal direction Well, you could call this Fourier norm, Mukai, ADHM, or something different numbers. But there's a kind of analog of the Fourier transform, which is well known in this four-dimensional gauge theory. We want to do that in the normal direction. So that's that's what I want to explain. Try to explain. But this is this is. But the what what this, so we don't miss the whole point, and we get try to get into technicalities more. The, the upshot of this is that we're going to have some way, some other kind of nonlinear gauge theory just defined over y, and we count the solutions of that, but there'll also be a jumping phenomena 
these special values which will exactly compensate. So W of Y is going to be defined by counting solutions to certain equations, in fact, sort of a cyber witten like equation over Y. Also bringing in this background connection A infinity as well. So let's just say, so W, w of Y will be defined, defined by, by counting solutions of a cyber witten type equation over y. So if, if, you, if I don't really get to explaining what this equation is properly, at least you get the idea of the some kind of equation. Okay. So now we come to Part two of the talk. So I want to I want to explain all this. So this is where we get to some Poisson geometry of moduli spaces. So I want to recall the basic notion of a moment map. So let's go a bit quickly because moment map. If we have a Lie group gamma acts on a symplectic manifold V, symplectic form omega V, we have the notion of a moment map mu from V to the dual of the Lie algebra of gamma. I, mean, I, I won't give you the, let's assume we know that. It's a generalization of the notion of a Hamiltonian. The fundamental example for us would be to take uh, V to be the Lie algebra of gamma, tensor R2. And uh, let's assume we have an invariant quadratic form on our Lie algebra. So we can take the tensor product of the quadratic form and the standard skew form on R2 to get a symplectic form on V. And then, so we can think of this as two copies of Lie of gamma, and then the moment map of sigma 1, sigma 2 would just be the Lie bracket of sigma 1, sigma 2. Thinking of a, an element up here as a pair, sigma 1, sigma 2. Some little example. Well, that's, that's one funda fundamental example, A. Fundamental example, B, take a, rem take a not a Riemann surface, an oriented surface, um, a bundle, P, the group, such a group G over sigma, and the space of connections, A on P, then uh, this has a symplectic form given by uh, a tangent vector of space of connections is a bundle valued one form. So you take the, the, the wedge product of these things, take the trace and integrate over sigma. <coughs> and then going back to a tier and bot, we know that the moment map is just the curvature can be in interpreted as an element of the dual of the Lie algebra of the gauge group acting on the space of connections. In fact, if you, think, if you take your surface sigma to be a torus and think of a connection as being given by a pair of covariant derivatives in the two directions, then these two examples become united because the curvature is just the commutator of the covariant derivatives. <coughs> well, that's not they become symbolically united and the symbols you write on the blackboard are the same, but not, not actually completely logically united. Anyway, uh, the whole discussion we're going to have is based upon these basic facts, which I think have appeared in the... Yeah. So this, you see, leads to the fact that if you take the moduli space of flat connections, appears as the symplectic quotient of the space of connections, and then... As such, it gets its induced symplectic structure. So there's a generalization of this story, staying in two dimensions. Uh, if supposing, supposing G acts on, on some other manifold, Z, with symplectic form omega Z, then we have a, a moment map, say, MZ, for this thing. So Z goes to G star which you identify with G using a 
an invariant metric, assuming we have one. So then we can take an associated bundle over our surface sigma, and we can study sections of this bundle. <coughs> so we, have, we can look at pairs of a connection and a section. And there's a, uh, uh, so we also have to choose a volume form on sigma. And then in an obvious way, there's a symplectic form on this product. The, there's, there's a symplectic form on the connections that we had before, and there's a natural obvious symplectic form on the space of these sections derived by integrating the thing we have pointwise. Mm. Uh, and then we have a moment map, which is just the sum of the two moment maps, mu of A S would be the curvature of A plus um, uh, sort of pointwise we take the moment the, the fine dimensional moment map of S and multiply by the volume form. So we can get we generate equations of this type coupling a c the connect curvature of a connection to a section of an associated bundle. And often we complement that by assuming that we have a Riemann surface structure on sigma, and then we can take, and assuming this is actually a, a, a complex Kähler manifold, and then we have a natural D bar operator. So we can write down equations like this. And there are many examples, such as so essentially Hitchin's equation appears more or less in this way, and the vortex equations, and I think maybe this is called the coupled sigma model or something. You know, there's a big literature in, in about these kind of equations. Do we, do we all agree? <laughs> what the S? S, S is a section of this associated bundle. So in roughly speaking, in Hitchin's case, S would be called phi, and this would be a sort of a phi star phi term. Um, can you again uh, tell us what you said at the moment uh, on the map here? Mu of A and S is F of A plus. This is we take the curvature of A plus the moment map applied to S. Um, and if you think about it, that lives. So that we, we, Multiplied by the volume form, the two form, that lives in the same place where this lives. Uh, but we have, we're taking this symplectic form on a product so we could scale the two factors. We have a parameter, and we can, so we could put a parameter epsilon in there. Is that the right place? No, I think it's the other one. It's the other. Don't have to put the sign here, right? This is what I want to put. This is this is an equation. If sign is a given thing, this is an equation for a pair consisting of a connection and a section of an associated bundle. So we want to generalize this in two ways. The dimensions three and four. So we're going to get up to seven by actually splitting it into three and four dimensional piece. There'll be another four plus four dimensional story which would apply to the Cayley submanifold situation which would look more symmetrical in some ways. So here we want to consider the hyperkähler quotient, hyperkähler situation. <clears throat> so we have now a V with a hyperkähler structure so we have a, a triple of symplectic forms, omega one, omega two, omega three, corresponding to a triple of complex structures. In the usual way. 
And then we can consider a hyperkähler moment map, if we have a group act gamma acting on all of this, um, which would take v to the, Lie, the Lie algebra of gamma star tensor R3, just has three components giving the, the moment maps with respect to the individual symplectic forms. Hmm. So the fundamental example Uh, we take um, V is equal to the Lie algebra of gamma tensor R4 or H or something, um, like that. <coughs> we have this structure coming from the H side, uh, and then our, so <coughs> we could think an element of this, choosing a basis as being a quadruple of elements of the Lie algebra, so mu of sigma naught, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, it will have three components. One will be sigma naught bracket sigma 1 plus sigma 2 bracket sigma 3. Another will be sigma naught bracket sigma 2 plus sigma 3 bracket sigma 1. And the other one will be sigma naught bracket sigma 3 plus sigma 1 bracket sigma 2. Gamma, gamma is some Lie group with a um, invariant quadratic form on its Lie algebra. For example, a unitary group. And that would be the... So this is this combination of brackets is the key thing to take away. So what is the analog of the, the other fundamental example? Uh, supposing we take a four manifold, X4, hyperkähler. So we have a triple of two forms on X4. And we do gauge theory over this in the same way. We have the space of connections, A. This is an induced hyperkähler structure given by, so say, omega I of AB will be the integral of trace A wedge B wedge omega I over X. This defines a symplectic form on the space of connections. And uh, what is the um, hyperkähler moment map? Uh, these things form a basis for the self-dual form. So we can write F plus as the sum of Fi omega I in terms of this components, the connection and then um, mu, the hyperkähler moment of A, is just F plus of A. It has these three components, which give the three individual moment maps. So this is all, again, very, very well known. So our instant on moduli space on our, four, our, four, our hyperkähler four manifold appears as the, called the hyperkähler quotient, mu minus one of zero, over our gauge group. <clears throat> and so we get, just by general theory, an induced hyperkähler structure of this moduli space. Uh, here, we're perhaps assuming that X is compact, if X is R4, there's a similar story, but we have to worry a bit about the behavior at infinity. So in particular, we have to use the base, to the, the, the gauge group of gauge transformations that are trivial at infinity. So X is R4. Just say similar, but we worry about infinity. We have to do some adjustments. Okay. Well, that connection is not changed by, by self dualism. Is it? Well, that connection is not changed by self dualism. Yeah. Compared to the previous case for instance. So this is one analog in four dimensions of the two-dimensional story we had. We want another analog of the, well, that was part of it, of, of the coupled story. These coupled equations. So 
So let's just do this over a torus for simplicity, over the three torus, because I'm running out of time. Supposing we consider a bundle over torus with a connection, we'll call it alpha, um, we have some we have some Z hypercala on which our Lie group G acts. Then we can form, as before, an associated bundle of Zs. Our three torus. Look at sections of this. And we can write down an equation. Um, what is the equation? We take the curvature of our connection. Um, so this is equal to uh, a moment map, a hypercalar moment map of our section, where here we, um, so we're using the fact that the, the tangent, in the special case, the tangent bundle of the three torus is trivial. So the curvature of our connection has got actually three components, and those are supposed to match up with the three components of mu. If we had a bit more time, we could do the, what would work for a general base manifold. At the same time. So this is an equation which is analogous to the couple, the way we coupled on the surface case, the hypercalar analog. And there's also what's you know I don't have time to do it. There's also a, an equation to the analog of the Cauchy-Riemann equation. It's called the Futter equation, which I, for lack of time, I won't explain. But it's a, it's a certain equation that you can define analogous to the Cauchy-Riemann equation using the hypercalar structure on the fibers. Also a kind of version of the Dirac equation. <laughs> so we can also put an epsilon in here. So let's put it in sure. In just the same way. So the first Ten minutes. That's good. Um, the first proposition is that this equation. Let's call this dagger epsilon. So it's a slightly vague proposition. This equation, uh, our equation star, we wrote down, can be viewed as an instance of this equation, in which the space Z, our, our hypercalar space is the space of connections on our form, on the bundle over our form. So proposition one. So the star epsilon, let's say the equation of star epsilon is a special case of our dagger epsilon. Z is equal to the Space of connections on a model over our form. So, if you look, so that was the. Yeah, you saw this was the curvature in the three dimensional piece. The moment map, the, cur the self dual part of the curvature, that's the moment map. That's what we said. That, that's good. This Futter equation, I didn't tell you what it was. That's the other FXY thing, turns out to be, had this natural interpretation. Is it something like Dirac equation, Dirac operator? It, it is a, it's a version of the, uh, yeah, sort of non-linear Dirac equation, I have to speak. But I, I don't. So, so this is a bit vague because um, I'm not telling you about this framing at infinity data and so on. But you get, that's, that's the point, that we can think of this seven-dimensional equation in this general framework, in the three and four dimensions. Hmm. So now, let's... Let's make our Fourier, Fourier norm ADHM transform. So let me go over the ADHM construction. For instance, Thomas, number R4. So here we have A, an instanton, a self-dual connection on a bundle E over R4. 
the second Schoen class K. Let me extend to the force sphere in the familiar way. Um, or a, say a UN bundle, construction of UN. Then this, the ADHM construction uh, is a correspondence between these things and some fine dimensional data. Uh, the, the crucial part being um, a vector space H, a complex vector space of dimension K, and uh, maps VI from H to H, uh, seems to be well, in, in U of H. So, in the, in the Lie algebra of the unitary group of H, so skewer joint maps, I equals up to three. <coughs> and, um, well, there's going to be some other data, but lack of time. These are going to satisfy some algebraic equations where the, sort of the main part of the equations are the things we wrote down. We take these elements, so these live in this Lie algebra, and we can take that load of commutate that we wrote down. So, so to a first approximation, this will be the transform. You have the instantons correspond to a vector space of dimension k, and you take these matrices satisfying this commutator equation. But that's not exactly right. You have to use another vector space, E infinity, which in fact is the fiber of our bundle when we extend it to the force sphere. And so there's some other data, which I call it lambda, which oh, in fact is a map from H to E infinity tensor, the negative spin space of our R4. <clears throat> so, in fact, our equations have some lambda terms. So, just say lambda start, I'm, not, I'm running out of time. So, there's also a contribution from lambda in these equations, rather crucially. So, we sort of modify the obvious thing by this stuff from infinity. But these are precisely the equations. That, so, we're precisely in the, for the Bs, we're just in the situation we considered before. This live in the, the Lie algebra tensors with the quaternions. Uh, this is the moment map. There's also a quaternion structure on these things. And these equations are just the moment map equations for this pair, B of lambda, is equal to 0. So this is a transform between two different sort of hyperkähler pictures. Here we have the space of connections with its hyperkähler structure and a moment map. Take the symplectic quotient. Here we have a space of fine dimensional data, lots of matrices, with a moment map, take the solutions, divide by the obvious the sort of the symmetry group, and we get the same moduli space. And so there's a lot, there are many, we call it like a transform, there are many similarities in the structure that you see on the two sides. <coughs> but I'm almost at the end of my time, so Let's not say anything about that. All right. We can also we could write down how this H appears as the, the solutions of the Dirac equation coupled to A. And you can write down simple formulae for these Bs in terms of that. So let's get to the, the final point. Uh, the proposition two is that if we set epsilon equals zero, so we can also uh, okay. So, see, what we can now do, we can consider our equation dagger, but not with the infinite dimensional picture, but with this fine dimensional story in the fiber direction. So we have a, um, we have a, we have a Fourier transform, as it were, dagger hat with an epsilon, where this would, um, so S is now going to be a, a, a B lambda at each point. So we, this is sort of, kind of a, a, a generalized Seibo-Witten equation, you might say, but where we have these rather complicated set of extra fields that we're coupling our connection to. 
but we can fit into the general framework uh, and we can write down this equation. <coughs> um, and the point is that when we, we can do that both for, for non-zero epsilon and for zero epsilon. And the, the second crucial fact is that when epsilon equals zero, the solutions correspond. We get the same solutions of this coupled equation whether we work with connections over R4 or with this fine dimensional matrix data. And that's, that's not a difficult, particularly difficult fact because um, it's the, same, the main part is that we're saying that at one point of view, on the fibers, we're supposed to have instantons, and instantons are given by the solutions of this moment map equation. When epsilon is zero, we're precisely solving the moment map equation. So you need to think about how the other stuff works, but that's basic. So just to finish in 30 seconds, so proposition two, when epsilon equals zero, the solutions of hat and hat correspond. So our jumping, which occurs precisely when we have um, the solutions of this uh, equation that we wrote down from the point of view of the connections, is also the jumping what you see when we write down this system of five dimensional equations. And so w, so w of y is defined by counting solutions of uh, equations, so the transform version for epsilon not equal to zero. So in just, uh, in just the same sort of spirit as when we have a solution of our equation, our adiabatic limit, then we do get this bubbling of instantons in the same way in the fine dimensional story. If we have a solution of epsilon equals zero, then in a family, we will lose a solution of our um, of, our, of our coupled equations, i.e. Okay, so that's the end of the, the amount of my time. Um, I hope that gives an idea of how this interesting, intricate geometry of gauge theory in four dimensions, which is linked to the Poisson geometry in two dimensions, other things, appears in a very interesting way when one tries to study these problems in higher dimensional gauge theory. Questions or comments? I wanted to just. Well, that's just. Oh, I'm sorry. That's just. Please. Go ahead. When epsilon is not zero, uh, some, so these equations, especially in two dimensions with border equations, there is this phenomenon that. Uh, so generically, you you have a map. The solution defines a map to the uh, quotient space of your mm -hmm. fiber by a group action. But. Uh, Occasionally, you, you have these solutions which, which cross the unstable locus in, in, the, in the target space, which, so you cannot caution. So in, in this case, it would be the, the case when B and lambda vanish simultaneously, for example, some, somewhere on your, on your three torque. That, that's right, and that would be... Um, so, that sort of thing would be related to these higher co-dimension singularities that I was... Yeah, so if... Right, there are also... Non we were, to, to make this correspondence, we also have some non-degeneracy conditions. For example, the lambdas shouldn't be all zero. And if your solution violates those conditions, there'll be some kind of more complicated singularity going on. I just wondered what the correspondence meant. The correspondence? Yeah, the thing you're stating. I, mean, I don't see how to go from solution to a PDE to a solution of an algebraic equation, or, or vice versa. Well, that, that's really this ADHM stuff. I mean, it's, it's a, this, this is more just a parameterized version of this ADHM discussion. 
Yeah, I've heard of that. I, I know what the name stands for, but I don't understand the math. Yeah, but it would take it would take a few more. It would take me a bit more time to explain. No, but what's the idea? I mean, you know, no, no, I mean not the explanation. How? Why do these algebraic things correspond to solutions of this interdimensional problem? This uh, well, from one point of view, you can think of it in terms of fixing complex structures, and then you're describing holomorphic bundles, but then this becomes a, essentially a rather well, a, a more obvious construction in algebraic geometry using well, resolution of the, using the causal resolution of the point. So um, if you're working with holomorphic things, then you've got the action of multiplication on the cohomology. So here, roughly speaking, the Bs are defined by the multiplication of the coordinate functions on the solution of the Dirac equation. But that doesn't really make sense, because you can't... If you multiply a solution of the Dirac equation by x, it's not a solution of the Dirac equation, but Project. roughly speaking, it almost is. So that's a, it's the interaction between the Dirac equation and multiplication, which is what's going on. Okay, thank you. Something like that. Any questions or comments? Uh, maybe I have one simple question. So this uh, uh, this functional W. Mm -hmm. So so is is it just counting solutions uh, for epsilon equal to on the fiber for epsilon equal to zero, or what was uh, in the end? The no, it's counting solutions over y of this coupled equation. Oh, for epsilon non-zero. For non-zero epsilon, mm -hmm. and then in a in a similar way to the other side you lose compactness if you have a solution for epsilon equals zero because in fact you can scale epsilon away if you scale your b and lambda then you can scale epsilon back to one so epsilon going to zero is the same as fixing the equations and b and lambda going to infinity which is but so actually I'm, I'm lost now, now I'm lost so these equations know only about the three dimensional manifold actually yeah. No. Well, they know about the manifold and the, the restriction of the connection of the background bundle to it. But if I just think about this abstractly, these equations describe something like quasi map or three manifold into the modular space of instantoson R4. Right? This footer, footer quasi map. Right? Well, it's quasi yeah, that's right, but, but of course it's not exact because. Right, we were saying the, ta the normal bundle was trivial and so on. It would be a, a section of a bundle of instanton moduli spaces. Okay. Yeah. It's a kind of twisted quasi bundle. Yeah, twisted because, by the, by the because in the sense that in a polymerial instanton, sometimes you can approximate by quasi maps of, of something two dimensional into the moduli space of flat connections on something also two dimensional. Oh. Yeah. Are there any more questions or comments? Uh, if not, thanks again.